there's no light switch that suddenly flipped. You know, people like to uh, talk about it being an overnight success. It was at least a 10 year overnight success. So it just set it up for, for the audience was not being addressed. And Nirvana comes out, boom, metal, punk, you know, indie, alternative, it's like, here we are. By 91, it, was, it just exploded. And none of us expected it to, to have that much of an impact on not just music, but pop culture. I mean, 91 was just one of the greatest years for rock albums, period. There is a year in particular, and that is 1991, and the date is September 24th, 1991. It might be the greatest album release date in history. I think whenever you take a genre of music and you make it catchy and you make it something that you is easily gets stuck in your head, uh, that's how you elevate it from, from underground to mainstream. Nineteen ninety one was undeniably one of the greatest years in rock and roll history. Several of the core bands we've been focusing on in this series would go on to release their breakthrough albums and take over the music industry and pretty much the world. Nirvana's Nevermind in particular is known by many as the album that made grunge blow up, but there were a couple of different factors that set the stage for the explosion. So let's hear from those who were there how it really happened. A journalist who goes by the name of Everett True, who worked for the Melody Maker. Uh, Bruce and I endeavored to fly him over in exchange for some cover space and a feature story in Melody Maker, which was one of three big music weeklies at the time. And getting in those magazines we knew was going to be a big thing. It really was the English press that that broke those bands. Mud Honey and Tad and I think Nirvana went to England and the English press wrote about this Seattle explosion, this fabulous spread and in, in, uh, NME and Melody Maker and local press in Seattle paid attention after that. So then the band started to get local press, which and then uh, raise the numbers in the audience and raise the opportunities to open for other uh, for other larger touring groups. The push that I had to do in music was talking to other radio stations. It was safer to get the next release from a proven artist than to jump on to bands that were new. So a lot of my conversations were, were programmers at other radio stations and saying, no, this is this is the real deal. And where there's a sound garden, there's an Alice in Chains. And where there's a mother love bone, there's a Temple of the Dog and Pearl Jam. There's a lot of factors that happen, um, culminating in the success of Nirvana Nevermind. But there are things that set that up. Well, one, our success, you know, we signed a major label. That was a big deal in that, you know, until so people start looking at it and they, and, they, and they see it, there's a whole bunch of bands like, you know, we get signed and other la labels come to see what else is around Seattle. They, Love Bone gets signed, um, Nirvana gets signed, uh, Tad goes on to another label. But outside of Seattle, those doors were opened by bands like the Beastie Boys, Metallica, and James Addiction at Faith No More. The record companies are still not cluing into the fact that there was an audience there that grew up with, you know, Joy Division and, and, and the Meat Puppets and, and Bauhaus and and Wire and Black Flag, they, they were still looking for new Beatles or another Aerosmith. The slow build from, yeah, from the early 80s on, it was it was just a matter of time. I think everywhere it's this, it's this, this, it's the same story, the same thing happens, that there's an evolution of uh, culture and consciousness that's building toward something and, and finally that reaches a critical state Everything up until that point, you know, there was no, there was no light switch that suddenly flipped. You know, people like to uh, talk about it being an overnight success. It was a, it was at least a ten-year overnight success. So everything happened very incrementally. Needless to say, there were a lot of great things happening for the scene, but some of them spelled devastation for many of the members of it. 
Mother Love Bone were seen by many locals as the next big band, and in March of 1990, they were just days away from releasing their debut album, Apple, when the unthinkable happened. Frontman Andrew Wood's fiancée, Zana, found him unresponsive at home, and he was rushed to the hospital, where he spent several days in a coma until his loved ones made the decision to say goodbye. He was a great guy. He, he was just awesome and funny, and making with music with him was easy. You could always count on him to just come up with something. He was great to play with because that something was substantial. He had a bigger than life stage persona. He was a big presence in the room, but at the same time, you know, you might reflect on it later and think and realize, ah, we didn't actually know that guy, you know, that well. He kept a lot of things close to the vest or buried. So I met those guys, I think at a malfunction gig or something at the Central Tavern. So we were just kind of always acquaintances. Uh, we never really played music together or hung out that much. But once he was Chris's roommate, um, I started seeing him a lot more when I would go over to band practice. And he was, he had a big smile, big hug, super warm, great personality. Funny is just wicked funny. He was 24 years old, and his death was a result of complications from a heroin overdose, a tragedy that has plagued rock and roll for decades. He was not aware of a, that there was a problem there. He was not, uh, did not fit, you know, sort of your classic idea of a, someone with a drug problem. If you didn't know, it's kind of, if you didn't know, you wouldn't know. We were told by other people close to him, and, and actually, I guess there were people in our camp that that knew more than I did. So that's I really all I can talk about is my own personal ignorance about it. I was not aware. I was not aware until you know, I guess until he was going to rehab. I was aware that when we were in Sausalito recording that. That there was some concern, some issue with keeping Andy out of the city. It was a, a kick in the, absolute kick in the gut to the entire community. And I, I go back to that moment as to when things changed, when um, the rest of the world was coming to our doorstep, whether we wanted it to or not. And sometimes the price is quite steep. While this loss was horrific for all of Andrew's comrades in the Seattle community, his family, and of course his fiance Zana, it hit his roommate and close friend Chris Cornell, who was on tour at the time with Soundgarden, in a bit of a different way. He began writing songs that he knew wouldn't fit in with Soundgarden's catalog, and approached some of Andrew's bandmates in Mother Love Bone to see about putting them together. We were on tour when we heard Andrew passed away. Chris was, he was crushed. It hit him really, really hard. When we got back from that tour, he started writing material that would eventually become the Temple the Dog album. Lost Andy Wood in early 1990. Part of the healing process for Chris was to, to write a couple beautiful songs in, in his honor. That was all it was meant to be. It was just a couple songs. He gave me a cassette of Say Hello to Heaven and reached down and he had like, and he did everything on drum machine and guitar and bass um, on his four track. Gave the cassette to me and then he gave it to Jeff and Stone who, uh, you know, had lost their band, lost their singer. And they were really moved. Um, and they were moved to then write some of their own music and then get together and and play some of those songs that Chris and Stone had written. There, there was a lot more that um, came about when, when we did get together. So I think the floodgates kind of opened when we all got in a room together. It was absolute magic. It was 11 days and the most beautiful, beautiful record came out of it. It was very cathartic for everybody. The result was a 10-track album released in April of 1991, which featured songs that were both beautifully melodic and emotionally powerful at the same time. Cornell's vocals shone in a way that they hadn't previously on Soundgarden's various releases, and on one song in particular, he was joined by another singer who would also become one of the leaders of the scene, Eddie Vedder, 
a surfer from San Diego who had flown up to Seattle to join Jeff Ament, Stone Gossard, and Mike McCready's new band, Mookie Blaylock. Stone and Jeff were getting the, you know, getting the nucleus together for Pearl Jam. I think it was around that time when they were like, they were definitely writing tunes with Eddie. He had just come up to, you know, audition for Stone and Jeff um, and Mike. Yeah, so the whole thing kind of came together around the same time. I believe it was an invite from Chris to sing on this one song, Hunger Strike, and Eddie destroyed it. He delivered. You know, Chris is the just the god singer. But then you got like this other guy coming in there like singing the singing a verse. And it was it was cool. It was really cool. But it was one of those things that like, you know, Chris pretty much put that thing together and then and then Stone came in and wrote some fucking great songs as well so it was a good indicator of things to come for for uh, the Pearl Jam guys and um, and it really highlighted a, a, a different side of Chris's songwriting that wasn't apparent in Soundgarden. I thought it was a great record. Mm, you know maybe one of the better records to have come out of this whole grunge. Temple the Dog, that's a, that's a really great one. The whole Pearl Jam thing is fascinating because we knew of Mother Love Bone and Mother Love Bone was like, they were the ones that were gonna explode. That was like, that was the horse that a lot of people were betting on. And then Andrew passed away. And so to hear how Chris worked through that with some of those songs is really beautiful. It was the way Seattle honors its own um, and has done so again and again and again. And then to have the members Many, some of the surviving members of Mother Love Bone decide to continue forward and coalesce and create a new artist, a, a, a new band with a lead singer that is not Andrew too, but is a superstar in his own right. The excitement for Pearl Jam's debut release certainly was, uh, it, it was highly anticipated. Singing together on Hunger Strike was the start of a decades-long friendship for Chris Cornell and Eddie Vedder, and they performed it together on several occasions throughout the years. Though the Temple of the Dog album failed to chart initially, it was part of a series of albums that the bands we've been discussing all along put out in 1991. Screaming Trees released Uncle Anesthesia in January, Tad put out Eight Way Santa a month later, Melvin's released Bullhead in May, Mud Honey had Every Good Boy Deserves Fudge in July, and finally, we've come to August, which had a couple of pivotal moments. Mookie Blaylock decided to change their name when they signed to Epic Records to avoid any legal disputes, and they went with Pearl Jam, after Eddie Vedder's grandma Pearl and her homemade jam that was laced with peyote. However, when they released their debut album, they continued paying tribute to the basketball player their band was initially named after by naming it after his jersey number, 10. You know, after Mother Love Bone broke up, Everybody just kind of went their separate ways. You know, Jeff and Stone had a, a had a history bef that started way back, far be long before Mother Love Bone. It was natural for them to end up working together. Like Eddie kind of took the band in a different direction, I think. You know, they sort of lost the scarves and the the accoutrements and whatnot and just became more of a of a kind of a grounded regular rock band than Mother Love Bone was. I think the the songs were different from Mother Love Bone. I think they had a little more of a kind of a rock edge, you know, like there's definitely more guitar rock. The, the 10 album, you know, a lot of those songs Stone wrote and uh, those, you know, Stone and Jeff and Mike, um, they, they they sort of like changed they changed their sound a little bit to fit to fit Eddie. I think they were really keen on using his strengths, and it, it was one of those situations where uh, it was good from the very beginning. <laughs> obviously, since many of the songs were already put together prior to Eddie Vedder joining, the recording process was a swift one, and they released ten on August twenty seventh. The lyrics on the record covered a lot of ugly topics. Even Flo was about a homeless man. Wygo dealt with psychiatric facilities. Jeremy was about a boy who shot himself in front of his classmates at school. It was completely different from what Mother Love Bone had done, but it was fantastic in its own realm. Wow, the, the gift that Eddie Vedder has provided all of us musically. Pearl Jam 10 is, to me, 
a unique release, but when it penetrates your soul, your musical soul, 10 is a release that can be compared to the Abbey Road of Seattle, the Dark Side of the Moon, the, the record that is complete as a unit from the first track to the last. Another piece of music released on August 27th of 1991 was, drum roll please, Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit. And while it was not an instant success, it received heavy rotation on some radio stations in the US, and the country slowly but surely started looking at Seattle. When Smells Like Teen Spirit came out, we knew something was happening. First of all, everybody was talking about the song, and it was like a perfect storm. It changed everything when that song came out both the rock format in radio and the alternative format merged. All of a sudden, it changed everything. Grunge changed that completely. There was a lot of great records and a lot of hard work in touring and momentum. But that song and its impact was so spectacularly huge. That was really something happens once in a generation. And I really think that blew everything up. You knew that there were a lot of people like myself, like my friends in, in the band I was in, who wanted, they, they wanted something different than what we were getting from MTV. We, it was time, it was, it was time for a change. And then Smells Like Teen Spirit came out and it was just, it was, it was, then it was, it was on. Nirvana had recruited Dave Grohl on the drums the year prior, and they became even more of a powerhouse trio than they were originally. With their sophomore album in mind and the desire to sell more albums than Bleach did on Sub Pop, they sought advice from Susan Silver and signed with a major label. Kurt Cobain knew he wanted to make a record with more pop hooks this time around, and is quoted as having said he wanted to sound like the Knack and Bay City Rollers getting molested by Black Flag and Black Sabbath. September 24th, 1991, was a day Nirvana unleashed the second album. It just set it up for, for the audience was not being addressed. And Nirvana comes out, boom, metal, punk, you know, indie, alternative. It's like, here we are, you know, we're just waiting for you to like make a record we like. And they put out a record they liked and there it went. And then, that, and then all the Seattle bands started getting attention as well. It was the sound of Nirvana, but then MTV was everything. And it was the video for Smells Like Teen Spirit that just solidified everything for me. Kurt also happened to be gorgeous, so that was an added bonus. But I think that it was the fact that he was effortlessly cool. It was such a juxtaposition to all of the larger than life rock bands that had been in the mainstream up until this point. You know, with the big hair and the, you know, the studs and the belts and the pants. And like Kurt was so unkempt and so raw and so vulnerable. And to me, that was just the most badass. And I think the fact that it, he was so approachable or accessible or relatable that made him so powerful. And seeing somebody for the first time on television, the, the awesome thing about it was, I mean, <laughs> I mean, he looked homeless, you know what I mean? And here he is with his guitar and that, but the voice that came out of him, this was every single person on the planet, like real kids in America and in different countries all over the world. You know, this idea that you didn't have to look like some kind of a, you know, with rock music, it was all the teased hair and the glam and everything like that. He didn't look like that, you know? Eddie Vedder didn't look like that. I think whenever you take a genre of music and you make it catchy and you make it something that you is easily, uh, memorable and you, you know, gets stuck in your head, uh, that's how you elevate it from, from underground to mainstream. And I, it, it didn't hurt that they were also signed to a major label, but yeah, Butch Vig produced it. So they had a whole bunch of elements that pushed them in, in that direction. Probably the, the main reason why, they, why a band like Nirvana broke open was because every single song is catchy, basically. There was, they didn't, and, then, and especially Nevermind didn't have a single filler on it. I mean, that, that whole album to me was powerful from, from the first to the last track. When I first heard it, I listened to it back to back. 17, 18 times nonstop because I thought it was the greatest thing I'd ever heard. So, and maybe it was because it was kind of like a heavy Beatles, you know. I think Kurt Cobain had had an ability to put together simplistic songs in a way that was very appealing to lots of people. One of the moments that really blew it up was, you know, never mind. That was a an, an indicator that you know 
there's these uh, weird underground rock bands from the Northwest that actually write songs that sound fucking great on the radio and the kids are just totally into. It was crazy. I mean, I remember just like going to a, a local store at the time and hearing Nevermind over the sound, over the the sound system and at the time it was like oh wow if this record sells a hundred thousand copies it's huge but little did we think it would go on to sell millions of copies the moment that felt most defining the um when nevermind knocked michael jackson out of uh billboard number one and I remember we were on the soundgarden tour at that time and it it just stopped us all in our tracks we were on the tour bus and we got the news okay this is this is significant. Of course, we can't forget that Soundgarden also released a breakthrough album the same day Nevermind came out, Bad Motorfinger. By this point, the band had recruited Ben Shepard in place of Hiro Yamamoto, and the members of Soundgarden were impressed by how well their new bassist's artistic visions matched their own. Hiro was a huge, huge part of Soundgarden early on. But, you know, eventually he got, I guess, bored or just he wasn't interested in you know, being, being on the road, being on tour. He had other interests in life. One of the impressive things about Ben Shepard, one of the many impressive things is like, when he came into our band, we, we were sort of like, like at our creative peak almost. I was writing songs, Kim was writing songs, Chris was writing like just the greatest songs of his career. And then Ben comes in with like all this material that's like, that fits perfectly with what we're doing. It just became a little more artistic, artistically free. Like we had more, more kind of like, you know, areas that we could go in musically with Ben in the band. Bad Motorfinger certainly signified a shift for Soundgarden. While there were still songs written on odd time signatures and there was still a heavy punk metal edge to a lot of them, tracks such as Outshined and Rusty Cage started to get picked up by radio stations. As Nirvana gained momentum, more songs were being played by Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, and Alice in Chains on the radio, their videos were put into rotation by MTV, and they were eventually featured as guests on shows such as Headbangers Ball. Again, it wasn't an overnight success, but this was how and when the bands really started getting traction. In the following months, rock and roll and Seattle itself experienced some pretty drastic changes. I mean, it was something that could not be ignored. So even people that were maybe stuck and just wanted to play you know, hair metal or things like that, or just old rock, could not ignore the revolution that was taking place with the Seattle bands. Because what happened was, um, when Nirvana came out, then all of a sudden people started looking at some of the other bands, and some of the alternative stations played facelifts, some did not, um, even though Alice in Chains got worked at both. But it set up everything, because all of a sudden people were really looking at Seattle when they exploded. They were taking a second look at Soundgarden if they did not understand it the first time around. Bad Motor Finger started to get exposure and people were playing. Outshined, Jesus Christ Post, Rusty Cage. Well, yeah, Nirvana took off and then those that maybe weren't on board with the major label attention that was coming to Seattle because of Soundgarden and Mother Love Bone now came because of Nirvana. They started signing up anything Seattle. It, suddenly it was not cool to be commercial in any way. I mean, like as far as commercial, people would critique you and say, oh, your, your stuff's too commercial. It has too much of a pop thing or, or whatever. If it was obvious that you were going for, the, going for the golden ring, then you were suddenly kind of ostracized. And that was, so that was really interesting. Whereas in certain periods, just a few years prior, it was about, you know, trying to embrace what was cool at the moment. And, and suddenly, it became obvious that there was a complete reaction to all of that and you didn't want to have anything to do with it. And because of the success of Nevermind, you know, every record label on the planet wanted their own Nevermind and bands that, that really had no business going on playing stadiums or going out on tour buses and stuff were suddenly given that opportunity uh, for better or worse, I think. You know, some rose to it and others, it just, it, it probably ruined them more than it helped them. As far as how the community changed, I think a lot of people moved here to get a record deal. A lot of people moved here to be part of this unique experience. Many people also look at grunge as the sole thing that killed hair metal. 
Big hair, animal print, and colored spandex were replaced with flannels, oversized clothing, and Doc Martens. But most importantly, grunge showed the world that music didn't have to be flashy to be great. Grunge killed the cartoon rock star. Because, like, the 80s had really just, like, everything that started to be born in the 70s, sort of like with Queen, with Freddie, with Kiss, with just the, you know, the grandiose, you know, the spandex rocker, the glam rocker. It got so cartoonish. The grunge showed us that. Like the big hair that hap that was going on in the in the mid to late eighties with a lot of lot of bands, that was suddenly, you know, that was not that was not cool anymore. And like lyrically, like if you were singing about fast cars and girls and like that wasn't that wasn't cool. Like and the lyrically things were really cool during that period, you know, like what how Kurt Cobain would approach things because it was very fragmented and you didn't understand everything that was being conveyed, but you knew it was, you knew it was, there was something in there that was really profound. And, and more than anything, the melodies were so good, it didn't matter. Well, hair metal was so, it felt like silly and positive and fun. It was just like party music, right? I don't know why it took a turn the way it did, but it went from like, one extreme to the other, like how it went from that to that, I have no fucking idea, but I'm glad it did. Now we have both. We have two great moments in rock music that are equally enjoyable. And it's just, it's what mood are you in today? You know, you know, rock has always been kind of very cyclical and it, you know, it has its time in the sun, but overall it's always been kind of an underground art form. And if you look at it throughout history, you know, like there's renaissance periods of rock and roll. Like if you look at the 60s and the 70s, that was a renaissance period of rock and roll. And then the 80s came in and, and you know, and pop music kind of took over again and the rock band started to kind of follow suit to the pop artists. And so when the 90s came in, the, the grunge bands, like they came in with, there was no glitz and glamour. There was no showmanship. There's none of that. You know, there's none of that glam 80s rock. Like where, you know, it wasn't about what they were wearing or what they were doing. It was about what they were saying. And they came in with such a force of, of just guttural, primal, pure and utter power that, you know, was just honest. It was more dangerous than the say party music of the hair metal that was happening at that period of time, you know. When you're doing a song, I was talking about a song breaking through a rusty cage or something that is almost considered by many sacrilege to do Jesus Christ pose. I mean, those things, uh, you know, freak some people out as rock and roll's always done and should do in some way. I think grunge uh, cut into hairspray cells for sure. Like the Nirvana song, Come As You Are, I think that kind of summed it up. It appealed to kids on a, on a deeper level, I think, than than the um, fashion, the style, even though then, of course, it was compromised to become a fashion. I mean, it's it's common knowledge that I don't think he meant to do it. It's just what happened that Kurt Cobain literally eliminated a genre of music, um, ultimately with one album. It's a really good example of what was happening with Pearl Jam Plus. You know, they all of a sudden MTV started getting behind a live <clears throat> and then even flow. And then by the time the Jeremy video came out, when you look at the videos that were out at that period of time and the, you know, the things that are really related to that period of grunge and how just incredibly dark those uh, videos were, whether it smells like teen spirit or whether it's man in a box, man in a box or or like something like Jeremy. Though a lot of the Seattle bands started to feel the effects of their increasing popularity by the end of 1991, they didn't quite realize just how big they were actually going to get. In the next episode, we'll talk about some of the killer albums that were released in the following years, newer grunge bands that started breaking into the mainstream, and unfortunately, how fame and fortune caused a lot of these musicians to burn out and fade away.